All right, in this video, we're gonna talk about contact forces, which are a type of force that basically just involves two objects that are directly touching each other. All right, so if we look at this picture here, we have these two women on ice skates who are touching each other and either pushing against each other or maybe they're holding hands and pulling each other together. But either way, because there's direct contact there, that's how we can identify this as a contact force. So there are other types of forces that we'll get into later called distance forces that don't involve direct contact. But because this force here involves the direct contact of two objects or people or whatever it might be, that is what makes it a contact force. All right, so we're gonna look at a few different types of contact forces here. The first type is called applied force. And so applied force is basically just a force that's exerted by anything, a living thing, a person, it could be an object applying a force. So if we look at a couple of examples here, this dog is pulling on this little toy here, right? So he's applying a force on the toy in that direction to the left there. And that's why it's an applied force because he's the, the dog, or maybe it's a she, the dog is applying the force in a certain direction to a certain object, whatever this toy might be here. All right, this would be another example of, a, of an applied force uh, with all these little kids pushing this car in this direction, right? So because they're pushing, they're directly touching the car, that makes it a contact force. And it's an applied force because it's something that they are exerting. They are applying to another object. All right, another example of a contact force is friction. So hopefully we have a bit of an idea of what friction means in everyday life. So friction is basically just a force that resists motion. And that's the key is that friction always acts against motion. So if an object is trying to move one way, friction always works against that. So if we have, let's say, a box sliding across a, a surface, right? If the box is sliding this way, if this is the direction of the motion, then the frictional force always acts against that. So friction would be acting to the left if the object is moving to the right, and if the object is moving to the left, friction would be acting to the right. So friction is always going to act in the direction opposite to the object's motion. Um, the, the key with friction is that it's not a force that is uh, it's ever going to be in the same direction as the motion. It always has to be in the opposite direction. So there's no way that friction can help the motion. It always has to resist or oppose the motion of the object. And another key with friction is that the objects have to be in contact. And this, this is where it gets uh, a little bit uh, tricky in that there are other types of friction besides uh, objects that are touching each other. Um, another example of that would be air resistance. So if you have like an airplane flying through the air, the air resistance pushes against that airplane. So really the object that's rubbing against the plane is just the air molecules that are in the air. All right, so air resistance is actually a type of friction, uh, but we're not gonna get too much into that. Um, there are two types of uh, friction. One of them is kinetic friction, and kinetic friction is what you're gonna have when objects are moving, at least one object is moving. So if this box here is sliding across the floor, if it's actually in motion, that would then be an example of kinetic friction. But if you've ever tried maybe uh, tr to push something really heavy that's sitting on the floor and you push and push and push and you can't make it move, that's still friction because friction is resisting your efforts to move that object. So even though the object isn't moving, we can still have friction and that is called static friction. So static friction is what you have when objects aren't moving. So either static or kinetic friction, they're both types of friction. They're just a little different in terms of when they occur. So if we have objects moving, then there's gonna be kinetic friction. If the objects are stationary, then the objects are, or then there's gonna be static friction. All right, so if we look at this guy pushing this little box or big box across the floor here, right? If he's, we can't really tell by this picture whether the box is moving or not, but if the box were moving, it would be kinetic friction. And if the box were stationary, if he's just pushing real hard and the box is just standing still, not going anywhere, then that would be an example of static friction. And I wanna take a quick sec just to kind of explain why we have friction, why friction exists. Um, 
this, this diagram here is kind of a blown up view of if you have two surfaces rubbing against each other, what that would look like. Um, if we look at this picture, if we imagine like the bottom of this box, we imagine the bottom of the box being this like smooth surface, but really any surface, even if it seems really smooth, is gonna have these jagged kind of edges where the molecules aren't all lined up in a perfect straight line. So if we kind of took this section here and we like zoomed in on it, really, really magnified it really close, we would end up seeing something like this, where the surface, this would be the surface of the box, and this would be the surface of the floor. And if we zoom in on this really close, we would see a bunch of jagged edges. So this, this bottom edge of the box would really have a bunch of little jagged edges in here that would rub against the jagged edges of the floor, and that's what's creating friction, because if you imagine these two surfaces trying to rub against each other, they wouldn't rub smoothly because we have all these kind of divots and, and uh, like peaks and troughs in the uh, surface. So again, this is something that you, you we couldn't see a surface like this by uh, just by like looking at it with our eyes. But if we were to use a really powerful microscope and zoom in really close on the surface, we would be able to see that it's not perfectly smooth, even if it looks smooth. It's, it's likely having a lot of these jagged edges that when they rub against another surface with jagged edges are going to create this friction and that friction is going to make it harder to move the objects. All right, so a couple of things with friction here. Uh, I want you to think about what are some of the ways that you could reduce friction between two surfaces? All right, so if we have, let's stick with the example of this guy pushing a box across the floor. If he's trying to push this box across the floor, let's say this were you. <laughs> if this is you, what are you gonna do to this box? Let's say you're having a lot, a lot of trouble moving this box across the floor by pushing it. What are some things that you could do to try and reduce the amount of friction between these two surfaces so that you could push the box more easily? All right, so if you wanna pause the video uh, real quick and maybe think of some of the things that you could do to make your life easier as you try and push this box across the floor. All right, so uh, we can go over a quick uh, some of the things that we could try and do here. Uh, the key with friction is we want the surfaces to be smooth. The more rough the surface is, the higher the friction is gonna be. So if you imagine if, let's say the floor, hypothetically, this floor were made of sandpaper, it would be really hard to push this box across the floor. But if the floor were made of ice, then the ice would be a lot smoother and slicker, and that would allow the box to move across the floor more easily. All right, so one thing that we could do is make the surface smoother. All right, so if we were to, let's say, uh, melt or uh, freeze some water on top of the floor and make the floor really uh, slippery uh, like ice, that would be one way to reduce the friction. If you've ever tried, like, I know we had uh, freezing rain here a week or so ago. If, if you ever tried to like go outside for a walk on the sidewalk when it's really slippery like that, right, it's hard to get traction with your shoes because that traction that you're trying to get when you walk, that's really just friction between your shoes and the ground. So when the ground is really smooth because of that ice, then there's not a lot of friction and it's hard, harder to walk really. Um, so one thing we could do is make the surface smoother. We could, you know, like I said, make it uh, icy. We could maybe uh, lubricate the surface if we, if we put some oil maybe down on the floor, that would be cause a more slippery interaction between the box here and the floor so we could lubricate the surface that would be you know, along the lines of number one here as well. Um, another thing we could do is use wheels. So if we were to put wheels underneath this box or, or rollers or something like that in between the box and the floor, then the box would be able to roll across the floor more easily. There's a difference there. This, is, this would be called rolling friction Whereas if he's just pushing the blocks, the box along the floor, that's called sliding friction. So rolling friction is typically going to be significantly less friction than sliding friction. Uh, again, depending on the uh, materials that we're using and the friction between the wheels and, and the objects, and we get into a lot of different things there, but generally rolling friction is going to be a lot less friction than sliding friction. Uh, so those are, those are two easy things that we could do to reduce the amount of friction. Uh, kind of a cheating way would be to make the box lighter, or say a lighter box. 
All right, so if we make the box lighter, then there won't be as much friction. And you can kind of picture this in your head. If you try and push an empty cardboard box across the floor, it's gonna be really easy to do, right? Because a cardboard box by itself is really light. But if you take that cardboard box and put a bunch of heavy weights into it or a bunch of you know, big rocks or something that would make the box really heavy, then it's gonna be a lot harder to push across the floor. So the reason that is, is because friction has to do with the amount of normal force, which is the next force we're gonna talk about, pushing on the box. So the heavier the box is, the more normal force there's going to be and the harder it is to push it because there's going to be more friction. Whereas the lighter box, uh, the lighter box is going to have less normal force and then would be easier to push. All right, so see, th these are some of the ways that we could reduce the amount of friction between these surfaces. Make them smoother, use wheels, make the box lighter. Those are all good examples there. So I want you to pause the video again and think about what are some ways that we could increase the amount of friction between these two surfaces. All right, um, so some of the ways that we could increase the, the friction between these two surfaces would be basically the opposite of what we were trying to do before. We could, one, make the surface rough by maybe putting sandpaper in between the box and the floor or uh, maybe applying some like sticky residue to the floor. So something like that that would make the, the surface rough or uh, stickier or anything that's gonna grip more between the box and the floor, all right? So we could have a rough or even a grippy surface. Uh, another thing we could do is make the box heavier, all right? So if the box is heavier, same thing we talked about before, the lighter the box, the less friction there's gonna be, the heavier the box, the more friction there's gonna be. So if we wanted to increase the amount of friction between the box and the floor, we could plop some more items into this box that might be heavy and would then make the, the overall weight of that box greater and it would be uh, more friction because of that. Uh, so these would be two good examples. We can't really take away wheels. I know that that was one thing we said before to reduce friction. Obviously, if there's no wheels, we can't really take any away. Um, so these would be the two main things to increase the amount of friction here between the uh, box and the floor. All right, so last thing here, the last uh, contact force that we're gonna talk about is normal force. So normal force is a supportive force and it's exerted or applied by a stable object when another object contacts it. So a stable object would be something like the floor, the wall, the ground, um, anything that's not gonna move really. If it's really stable or secure in its position, then that's gonna be kind of the, the object that can apply normal force to something that might push on it. Uh, so some examples of this would be sitting in a chair, right? If you are, let's say you have a chair on the floor and you sit in that chair, right? You would then be pushing down with your weight on the chair. I can maybe pick blue here. So your weight is gonna be pushing down on this chair. So if the only force there were your weight pushing down on the chair, then you would end up just falling through the floor or falling through the chair or something. So there has to be some force that counteracts this or that balances this out. And that force is normal force. So because you're pushing down on the chair, the chair's surface is gonna push up on you. So that would be the normal force in this case. And the same thing with if you have something sitting on the floor, right? The weight of this box is gonna be pushing downwards on the floor and then the floor is in turn going to be pushing upwards on the box and that upwards force, the force of the surface or the stable object, in this case the floor, pushing on this other object that's contacting it, that's what normal force is, All right? Uh, another example would be pushing on a wall. So if we kind of looked back at that uh, other example uh, with uh, the guy pushing the box, uh, we would then, if we kind of imagine this box as a wall instead, like if we pretended that this was just a big wall here instead of a box that he's pushing on, the guy would be pushing on the wall this way and then the normal force from the wall would be pushing against him like that. All right, so the normal force, one of the keys with normal force is that it always acts perpendicular to the surface. All right, and perpendicular means at a right angle. So if the surface is like this and the normal force acts like this, it's in the exact opposite plane. 
So we make a right angle here or a 90 degree angle. If you're not too familiar with angles, that's okay. Don't worry about this too much. But uh, it's, it's good to know that normal force always acts uh, perpendicular to the surface. All right, so when we looked at the wall, right, the normal force acted like this, and that made a 90 degree angle here, right? So it's in the exact, it, it always makes an angle like this that's 90 degrees between the surface and the normal force. So if we had something kind of in between the wall, the vertical wall and the horizontal floor would be something like an inclined plane or a ramp like this. So if the ramp surface is going like this, then the normal force is gonna go like this because it's always gonna be at this right angle to the surface that the normal force is being provided by. All right, so normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. All right, thanks for watching this video on contact forces and I'll see you in the next one.